You're going to die there. And he himself knew that he was going to go, or not die there, you're going to be bound. And he himself knew he was going to go, and he said, I'll go there and I'll die if I need to. What's your life worth? Can I suggest to you this evening that this whole idea of our self-worth is anti-Christ? This whole idea of our self-worth is anti-Christ. Hey, uh, listen, how many of you would be willing to give up the one you love if God were to call them to something? How many of us would be willing of that? How many spouses would say, well, if it's God's will, I'd give, I'd give the life of my spouse. It would be much easier to give our own lives. Well, what about children? This is a struggle that parents will come to. And parents have to say to you, you study the Bible and you look at it, what it teaches, and you look at your children, you want, there's one surefire way of raising your children for the Lord and then ruining them is to not give them to the Lord. One sure fine. Boy, I mean, you can do everything right. You can be careful to protect them from wickedness. You can be careful to teach them the Word of God. But you don't give them to the Lord, and you'll wreck them. You take your children, you say, Well, God, you know, my children can do anything, but I don't want them being in the ministry. I don't want them to be poor. Well, I've seen parents that were like that before, and I've seen them ruin their children. I have. God, you know what? I don't mind my kids being in the ministry, but they've got to live stateside. I don't want them living in some kind of dangerous country where something terrible could happen to them. Well, that's a surefire way of destroying your child. You'll turn them into a, you will turn your child into a rebel if you don't give them to the Lord because they'll understand your spirit. You won't be willing to give them up. And boy, that's something tough, isn't it? It's a lot more di- it's easier said than done, isn't it? Something that you can say, well, that's really easy to talk about, but the actual doing of it is costly. I would say that this was very costly for the Apostle Paul because he gave his life in the doing of this matter. This is the kind of spirit that is in a Christian, a person who's given himself to the Lord. He understands that he's bought with a price. Boy, you can mock and you can scoff in this matter, but Christian, God will never use you if you don't give yourself to Him. Pastor, you think God wants me to die for Him? That's not the point. The point is whether or not you would. And if you won't, it's a surefire. I, I just promise you the Lord won't use you. We count our lives too dear. We count our lives far too dear. What, what, is, what is the worth of our life? What is it? The Bible says it's a vapor. It tarries for a while and vanishes away. And you know, as much as we love each other, that, you know, we're really not all that much. Your pastor, God could take my life like that, and I'm telling you, the world would go on. You know, it's humbling to think that the world went on before we were born and it'll still go on afterward. And most people in the world don't even know we exist and haven't been affected by our lives. You don't give your life to the Lord, and I promise you no one will be affected by it in any kind of positive way. But you give your life to the Lord, and you'll be amazed at what He can do with even a vapor, as He did with the Apostle Paul. Now, uh, so, and then we go down to chapter uh, 21, verses, well, we read those verses 8 through 14. And uh, now, chapter 24, let's jump ahead just a little bit. The Apostle Paul has gone to Jerusalem. He has taken the advice of the elders at Jerusalem. They, they advised him, they said, Paul... You've been accused of being disorderly and so, and that you have ignored the laws of God and that you have thrown away the Old Testament law and that you're preaching a new religion. And so they advised him to set aside four days for purification and go through this ceremony that would have been Old Testament law. It wouldn't have been something that would have purified him in the eyes of the Lord, but it would have been something that would have been acceptable in Judaism and certainly would have been acceptable for the Passover. It would have been a tradition of the Jews with regard to the Passover, and Paul did it. And then he went into the temple, which was the appropriate thing to do after he'd taken this vow and uh, gone through this purification process. And he mentioned the resurrection of Jesus, and the Jews that were there from Asia just exploded. They just blew up, and they caused a riot, and got him taken out. And he ended up being taken uh, by the people. At the same time, fortunately, uh, there was... Uh, what, who was it? It's the... Um, was it Fest, Felix? Yeah. Well, well, Felix is one of them. Anyway, he ended up getting with the um, centurion, being protected by the centurion. They found out about a plot of Jews who had said that they were not going to eat or drink for 40 days until they'd killed Paul. And I think they starved to death because it was two years before he ever even headed out to Rome. Uh, but uh, they had said they weren't going to eat until Paul was dead. And they ended up going before Felix, then Festus, and then King Agrippa. And ultimately, because Agrippa and, 
and Felix had asked him to go back to Jerusalem, and Paul knew that he wouldn't have, and to go before the Jewish council. Paul knew that they wouldn't be fair with him. They had falsely accused him, and each of the courts had found him innocent, but the charges were still brought against him of being disorderly and raising up a riot and being. Uh, the, the accusations specifically were he was disloyal to Caesar, which would make him you know, a problem for Rome, that he uh, had a, made fun of the Old Testament law and that he had been disorderly in the temple. And so, but none of those accusations, they couldn't bring in, they had conflicting evidence. One person stand up and testify of something and someone else would testify of something that contradicted it. And then he got before the council that was half uh, Pharisees and half Sadducees and he brought up that he believed in the resurrection because he was a Pharisee and they had such a riot between themselves they couldn't even talk about him. And so here's all this that has transpired and taken place, but ultimately... The Apostle Paul is on his way to Rome. He's, he says, I appeal to Caesar. And the reason for it was because what? He knew he was supposed to go to Jerusalem and be bound. The Lord had showed him that. And he knew he was supposed to go to Rome. He said, here, it's my ticket to Rome. I appeal to Caesar. Well, I want to look tonight at one person in the life of the Apostle Paul. And I want to look at his testimony in bonds. And we're going to look at how this person reacts. And this is the centurion who is responsible for delivering him safely to Rome. So that brings us to chapter 27. <laughs> Chapter 27, I know it's a long introduction, but I felt like if, if you weren't directly familiar or didn't remember the events, it would be hard uh, to know the context this evening or for it to make much sense. Now, chapter 27, verse 1, the Scripture says, When it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. Now, Augustus was a Caesar, Caesar Augustus. So Julius was one of Augustus' centurions. In verse 2, entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day, verse 3, we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. And so here's a centurion who is very polite toward the Apostle Paul, very respectful. I think the centurion must have, he certainly would have known the story between uh, behind Paul, and that Agrippa and Festus had said, hey, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, we could let him go. So they, they uh, Julius would have had a respect for the Apostle Paul and have felt that he was an innocent man. And so here he allows him the freedom to go and find refreshment and to meet with his friends. He's, uh, he is a prisoner, but he's not. he's a well-treated prisoner. He has all of his rights, it seems like, except for not having liberty. Uh, to do what he wants. So the next day, uh, the, verse 3 says, Judas courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. So now we look at a relationship that's beginning here. Here is Julius, who is a centurion, in whose household? Caesar's. And the apostle Paul, through his bonds, is able to have contact with an individual that is the mightiest man in the world. Caesar is the world ruler. He's the emperor of the world. And it wasn't like be a president of the United States. It was like being the emperor of the world. And it wasn't like uh, being an emperor where, uh, you know, you had a, a diplomacy and a democracy. It was where if anybody crossed you, you could do whatever you pleased. And if anyone opposed you politically, that was the end of their po political career. It was the end of their life. And they would be, uh, what do they call it, six deep? Or what do they call it, Chris? How is it? Um, six feet under? Yeah, six feet under. Bring in gophers bringing you mail. Um, anyway, yeah. Six feet under, gophers bringing you mail. They'd been dead otherwise, in other words. Okay, now, um, now when we had launched, I'm in verse 4, from thence we sailed unto Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea to Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So they're headed to Italy because guess where Rome is? Okay, just a little, uh, little uh, geography lesson there from the person that's just majors on geography outside the United States. And we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Snidus. The wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni. So they couldn't sail directly, they, the wind... Didn't allow them to, so they took a back route. And hardly passing it, came unto a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was a city of Lycia. 
Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, 